We are live. So here we go. Audio is getting ready to start for us in just a sec. And welcome to SEC Sports Roundtable. This is your host, Shane Bailey, coming at you. Back-to-back uh, -back episodes for those that are keeping up with things. If you uh, caught the last episode, we did a, or I did a mini post, a mini podcast yesterday, catching up on some things, and I'll touch on that again uh, through the course of this podcast. I'll, I'll uh, update everyone on that, but I want to welcome Blair Smiley. Hello, Blair. It's good to be back. Glad you're with us. Uh, got, uh, got a light podcast, I guess, today. Uh, we've got... Uh, Games, that's the most exciting thing. And, oh, yeah, man. And, you know, we're through. I guess, I guess what it boils down to is that, uh, you know, we can we, we can talk and plan and say who we think is going to be the best or is the best, but it's it's about time to, to put the action to it and uh, put your money where your mouth is or, or, or let the uh, let everything speak for itself because they're going to start football in four days. That's right, man. God, it's awesome. I'm excited. My dad came in this weekend, and it was his birthday, and I handed him a brand-new chrome cowbell for his birthday, name engraved and everything. It just got me excited to go ring it. Was that his best present ever? Possibly, because he's actually never had a cowbell, strangely. And he's how long has he been a season ticket holder at Mississippi State? Well, season ticket holder the last probably, I think this is his ninth year okay. um, straight. We He was a... I guess you could say season ticket holder probably when we were really, really young. But, but when we started getting into playing sports and my two sisters were cheerleaders, it we kind of ceased and desist on the old, uh, uh, you know, but 30 years ago, I mean, it wasn't that big of a deal. You know, you could always get a, get a ticket to a game. And we had uncles that uh, had two uncles and aunts that actually worked at the university. So, we maybe would go get a game or two, but we were so busy back then that, you know, it was more of listening on the radio and doing that type of stuff. But, uh, yeah, I've actually had a cowbell since I can't remember, so it's over probably 30 years old. Um, but it's just kind of interesting. He never had one. So I figured for his 70th birthday I would get the guy a nice chrome cowbell. So he's set up. That's uh it's pretty impressive. Yeah. And uh, what, did you put his nickname on there? No, nah, I just put uh, Gary S. Smiley in 1967, which is his year that he graduated from Mississippi State. So uh, I think he's kind of fired up. I don't know. Cowboy would look good on there. <laughs> it would have. That or G-Daddy that he's affectionately known by my son. And, then, and we could spend a whole, yeah, a whole rat hole on, on the debate between how that occurred, yeah. can we not? And yeah. we won't do that. Yeah. Uh, but let, let's uh, let's get into some things. Uh, let's get some housekeeping out of the way. Uh, really trying to work on our YouTube channel, uh, trying to put up some closed captioning stuff. So I'm going to be editing that stuff in so it, it's a little more reliable, but uh, I would... YouTube does its own version, and you might appreciate this or not, but, you know, the other hobby of mine is tech. Uh, and so the uh, YouTube channel, if you look at it, it can actually take a transcript of what is said, what we do here, and it automatically does it. And it's probably about 60% accurate. <laughs> Uh, I forgot what it would call SEC Sports Roundtable for the longest time. It wasn't even close. Um, but it was calling me Chamberlain as opposed to Shane Bailey. Um, I forgot. It, it, Drew Young wasn't even a name. Uh, it was, but it's been way off base. But it's it, it's amazing. It's starting to recognize patterns. And as I cor I guess as I correct the text, it's going to go back to that database. I don't know what they're doing, but it's starting to become more and more accurate uh, based on. Do they have like different regions where the dialect that they can actually determine? I don't you know. Do, I, they, do you have to pull up like the uh, Swamp People version to get the subtitles? To I actually... think it just would go blah 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 blah. <laughs> if if it if it did uh, if it did Swamp People, uh, I th I know that if you use good enunciation of your words and you talk nice and slow and you know the way you should be talking, except we're doing conversation, yeah. uh, it does a better job of recognizing uh, the words that that are coming out of your mouth, but. 
it, it's pretty amazing that it's it's even doing what it is. That's pretty cool. Um, so I'm trying to go through there, and and we've got you know fifty. This is our fifty second episode. Yeah. Because uh, yesterday would have been fifty one. It was episode fifty. We're always and if you're ever wondering, we recorded at zero 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 as a test because we didn't know if this would work. So that's why we're always one more podcast than the number. Uh, but so this is our fifty second podcast. So I have to go through and. You know, I've got to correct, you know, sometimes two hours worth of footage wow. on that. But uh, so, you know, I'm trying to at least get the welcome to SEC Sports Roundtable minutes of every one of them. Uh, but I'm going to try to go through and clean that up. And that should help our, our, our rankings because some of the ones that have been cleaned up a little more, like Mark Grace uh, is still left-handed episode. You know, it's got a couple thousand views on it already. Wow. And so, yeah, no, I'm I'm pretty impressed by it. And so that does make a big difference from the, uh, if, if anyone's listening uh, that's looking for social media tips, you know, that, that captioning file can really help in searches and showing up in its evidence uh, as you look at, at what what is done as far as our views uh, on YouTube. But, of course, the video is being seen on YouTube. We have done some Ustream live versions of this. Um, the last couple podcasts and this one as well, we're trying a Google Hangout uh, so we can get live interaction. If you're ever uh, listening to this and we throw a tweet out uh, when we're recording, you're welcome to join in and you can actually see what's going on and be part of it at times uh, with that Google Hangout. It's a public Hangout. Uh, but if anything, you can video stream live if you want uh, the podcast as we're doing it. We are on iTunes. Uh, as well as Stitcher Radio. That's two great ways to, to listen to the audio version of this podcast. And uh, you can do that on a weekly basis. The recordings over the summer have always been general, almost always have been Sunday afternoon. But, you know, starting next week, that's definitely not going to uh, be the recording time. We're going to be a little more flexible in our recordings. So they will not, uh, we can't guarantee you that, you know, check in Sunday afternoon because. We're all going to be involved with watching NFL football, uh, even though you know we don't we don't talk about the NFL here as much as we do uh, personally. We we all enjoy NFL, especially in Nashville with the Tennessee Titans uh, and some of the talk there. But uh, you know, so it's going to be a little more flexible in when we can work around our work schedules because we all do uh, day jobs and and have things that that keep us from doing this on a regular basis. And Monday is Monday night football. So probably Tuesdays, most most Tuesdays, it's it's looking like we're going to record this. So the podcasts are going to be out late Tuesday, early Wednesday, and so you know, in looking at numbers, you also saw a spike on Mondays when we were since we've recorded on recorded these on Sundays. You can definitely see that. So it's going to be interesting to see how all of those things play out as we get into the season. But we are just four days away. Uh, from the first kick, and that's going to happen here in Nashville. Uh, I think the Vanderbilt fans are excited about that. Uh, oh yeah, that's a big deal for for Vanderbilt to be able to host that game, even though it's a Thursday night game. Uh, it's the only uh, SEC game that's uh, pitting two SEC teams against each other. Right. Uh, week one, so uh, you know we'll we'll cover those uh, and look at those games as we get to it, but. Uh, I'll finish up with the housekeeping. I guess I, I do that so we can get the, into the news. But I did I did mention iTunes and Stitcher Radio for the audio version, YouTube for the video version. We are on Facebook at SEC SRT and Twitter. Uh, SEC SRT is our Twitter name. The Facebook page is a great place if you uh, are able to. You can watch the video version as well as listen to the audio version of the podcast directly from Facebook if that's easiest for you. Uh, we try to find out as many ways to deliver this to you as possible. Uh, as well as that, we do have a, a website, sccsrt.com uh, is the website. That'll bring you up there. Occasionally, you'll see some blog posts put out there. Uh, we've done some live blogging of events for individuals that might be interested in that. So I'm trying to trying to think of some of the things we've done in the past since you know we're getting into football season and probably gearing some of that stuff back up uh, but be looking for some of that as we we get comfortable with things and it's a great way to, to get in informed sometimes we have we have a poll up there you're welcome to participate in that uh, so that's all the uh, technical ways or ways that you can watch us or listen to us and find us so we'd love for you to join in the conversation love for some feedback to start occurring 
on a more consistent basis from those individuals out there. Uh, let us know you're out there live listening. That would be wonderful. Uh, Facebook is probably the easiest way, or Twitter. You know, we're going to be real quick to probably get back to you on that. We we do want to stay engaged with our audience there. So uh, let us know what you like, what you don't like, what you want to see, what you don't want to see, and we will we will take that into consideration. Doesn't mean we'll listen. We'll just you know take it into consideration. Right. Uh, but there there were a couple things that were happening in the news this week, and uh, let's start off in your neck of the woods and talk about some some going ons. Uh, Mississippi State. You want to do that for a few minutes? Yeah, why not? Uh, State had a pretty good start to their Thursday with uh, um, announcing a new hire for wide receivers coach and Tim Brewster to take over Angelo Mirando's um, uh, kind of abrupt resignation the previous Sunday. So basically a week from uh, today, a week ago today, um, he resigned for personal reasons. And... um, and kind of to everybody's surprise, which I think is a pretty big home run um, hire, is Tim Brewster, who is the former head coach, uh, I believe, from 07 to 2010 at Minnesota. Um, and if you follow college football, was really there at Texas under Mac Brown um, in really his heydays. He was actually the lead recruiter that brought Vince Young and that talented group uh of players through that won the national championship for Texas. And uh, so very, very, very strong recruiter, uh, pretty fiery guy, um, and really sought out the position according to him and Dan Mullen. Um, So started that off on Thursday as a very good start. And then uh, Mr. Joe Shad from ESPN um, ruled, kind of came out with a tweet in about midday with regards to Angelo Miranda was basically resigned under uh, pressure from an NCAA investigation into recruiting violations. So that kind of blew up the Twitter world for non-Mississippi State followers. And um, and so it uh, kind of got a little bit crazy. But over the last few days, that's kind of what was leaking out. I mean, obviously, he resigned for personal reasons, but it, it was leaking out that there was either something to do with improper phone contacts uh, with some recruits, that type of stuff, but is now kind of narrowed down where the search is with regards to Will Redman, uh, who is a Mississippi State uh, four-star safety from Memphis um, that is actually currently on the squad um, and with regards to a car that was purchased for him and could be some rogue booster stuff um, and according to a lot of sources could involve several other SEC schools Um, but this is really all tied back Shane to the uh, the kid at Auburn that has a grade change that just was ruled ineligible um, a couple of weeks ago and really has come out of this investigation of a seven on seven team in Memphis um, that coincidentally has the kid from Vanderbilt uh, the Kimbro kid um, that signed with Vanderbilt was on this seven on seven team. Uh, a kid from Georgia that's at Georgia now. The kid from Auburn, uh, the kid from Mississippi State, and two from Ole Miss. So there's about six kids that signed SEC scholarships out of this class, and so it seems to be a little bit of a battle between the high school coaches in Memphis and this seven on seven coach. And so we'll kind of see how it goes uh, for Mississippi State purposes and for uh, my purposes. Uh, pretty much all sources. Have, have pretty much gathered that this was uh, something that came about uh, when Dan Mullen and the administration actually found um, out whatever it was. Um, they were immediately reported and went through the channels that you're supposed to go through. So from an administration standpoint, it seems to be something that they're not terribly worried about. Um, they did confirm that there were some irregular um, I guess they termed it uh, recruiting irregularities. So they made everybody go back and uh, change the word investigation. But uh, they have been dealing with the NCA for several months and don't think anything major is coming out of it or it's going to impact uh, Dan Mullen or You can put that lipstick on a pig. It's still a pig, <laughs> That's right? right. So, uh, but uh, it was, uh, it's pretty interesting. Um but uh, we, I knew something happened whenever the guy abruptly resigns, abruptly resigns like he did, um, and uh, so we uh, we'll see how where it goes from here. But from all indications, are 
Um, they, there may be something that comes out of it, but nothing too terrible that they can't really overcome. Um, but it looks like Mississippi State did their due diligence once finding out and went through the proper steps and got rid of the coach. And um, So if it, it dings us a little bit and we've got a better recruiter and better coach out of it, sounds like a win-win for me. And I, I, I was trying to do three things at once, yes. so I caught – I knew I was aware of some of that information, but did you mention he followed Mullen from Florida? Yeah, Angelo Miranda. Because he'd if been you with know, Mullen yeah, for a while. Yeah, he was. Uh, he played football at Division three school and got a grad assistant job at Florida um, and followed Dan Mullen to Mississippi State. He was 26 years old. Um, Dan Mullen, after the Gator Bowl, um, when our wide receivers coach took the Mark Hudspeth, who was the – uh, was a prior head coach at North Alabama that won a couple of national championships in Division II. Uh, whenever he um, got the Louisiana Lafayette job uh, last year or two years ago, um, he uh, he was a wide receivers coach, and Mullen kind of hired uh, Mirando to kind of take over that. So he was the youngest SEC assistant uh, position coach in, in the conference, which was a pretty big deal. Um, and so now I'm – would say that his college career of coaching is uh, pretty much gone down the tube. Uh, nothing like a little being forced to resign that uh, kind of stalemates you. But was he a good recruiter? I don't know. I mean, he he seemed to be a guy that, um, and from I, all indications, are that he was. I don't. I don't. I don't know how good of a recruiter he was, and how many guys were tagged by him. Um, but I do know that. You know, he had a couple of Twitter mishaps last year that were little minor things that, you know, was watching um, some high schools play a jamboree and tweeted out that he was there and actually used the names of the schools, which you can't do, and stuff like that. So he, he obviously was flirting with a with a rules book that he wasn't in total control and seemed to be a pretty aggressive guy trying to make his make name. Mark. And so he obviously... Uh, some way, shape, or form found out or knew about this improper, whether it was an improper benefit, whether it was uh, done in kind of a backhanded way or um, doesn't, from all indications, doesn't don't believe that he was the one that actually did the violation, but he was aware of it uh, in kind of their back research, which is forced the resignation. Well, and, and I only ask that because, I mean, it's been proven time and time again that if you can coach and you can recruit in the SEC. Uh, They'll you, find a job for you. you. You'll find a job. It might not be with the same team because they have to let you go, you know, but you're yeah. going to end up on another another team's roster in short order. So, uh, you know, especially when it comes to re if recruiting is the only thing you're doing wrong, yeah. I mean, let's just look at USC and the coaching staff they have yeah. over there. To lose the job at UT before he found a new home at USC and you know Pete Carroll you know left USC in a turmoil from recruiting uh, issues straight to to the pro so uh, yeah you know it doesn't matter what you do as far as those things go if you can coach and so you know that that was the question I had and that's why I asked it in the way I did because that's the, that's the big thing is is if you can you can a lot can be forgiven yeah if you're uh, able to proof is in the pudding I guess so let's let's go on. I think that's that's a, a good recap of that information. Uh, some other news that has occurred this week, and this is just minor. I, I think it's just a one-game suspension coming from Auburn for Reese Dismukis. Yeah. Is that right? Is that he's an All-American freshman, All-American center last year. Um, yeah, it's it's and, a big uh, loss for yeah, even one game. But a little pub, public uh, intoxication. Um, but yeah, they said it was at least one game, but they haven't ruled. And they played Mississippi State the second game, so I'll be interested to see how that works. I mean, the thing that sticks out to me, not only obviously being a freshman All-American and you're probably your best offensive lineman, um, but you're talking about the guy that's, you know, basically the quarterback of the offensive line, the center that makes all the calls, and you're going to be having a Kyle Frazier that's going to be playing or starting uh, really his first game, so to speak. Um you know, and not to have the center he's been dealing with is it's yeah. got to be a little bit nerve wracking. So if I'm an Auburn fan, I'm a little bit a uh, little bit worried about that going yeah. into the Clemson game because it's going to be a tough game. I'd say to it's not with. like it's not like some of these other teams that have 
North Texas yeah. or Southeast Jackson Louisiana, State, yeah. Jacksonville State, Jackson State. Uh, they've got Clemson. You know, it is a home game for Auburn. I believe they're they're at Auburn, yeah. uh, so that helps. But it's still it, that that doesn't matter uh, when it comes to losing your starting. Yeah, center. I mean, and it helps that Clemson doesn't have Sammy Watkins for the first two games, and so you're not going to have to deal with an All American wide receiver that you know, destroyed the ACC last year as a true freshman. Um, but um, you know, he's got a little drug related incident over the summer that's forced a two game suspension. So um, they're going to be playing without that guy, which is a big, big piece. Um, but across the board, Clemson's going to be a more experienced football team. Yeah, it's so. going to be a tough, a tough match for Auburn. And and you make a good segue there. You said a little drug use over the summer, and that leads us to the last bit of news. And, and I don't want to say that it is what it is, but all indications from Knoxville uh, seems to believe, but based on the way the suspension came down, or the, I guess it was a, a, the release. Or was it a suspension? A, a indefinite, indefinite suspension. suspension. He's so. not been released. Derek Rogers uh, from Tennessee. Big loss. I mean, he, you know, and, and Drew had to go vul- to vulgarities on Twitter <laughs> to me. Uh, I can only imagine when I, when I asked him about that. And yeah. and John Schultz, the other UT big big he UT had to fan, just there basically was, jump off a building, right? It was there was no comment from him. Yeah. He he never replied, so we <laughs> I couldn't even get a check him. on his health. Yeah, that's a good good idea. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a huge blow to Tennessee because that that was what was going to make Tennessee something of a threat is that you had Derek Rogers, you had Justin Hunter, who was coming back, and from most indications, he's close to where he was. Yeah, he's still going, and that's the thing with Hunter, he's still going to have to get hit. Yep, be get up, realize that his knee's okay for him to be 100%. Because yeah. it's still mental for him. And he's even said that, that yeah. mentally he's that's his biggest thing is is overcoming that because he's never been hurt before. Um, and th- they've got another guy. I can't think. Patterson. Patterson. You know, so- Juco. I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, the the if you take Bray, Hunter, Patterson, Rogers it's scary. on the football field – the only thing that was a sure thing was Derek Rogers. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh yeah. It, it, he was the only one. I mean, to put up 67 completions last year, uh, receptions, and over a thousand yards on an offense that couldn't do anything the last six games. You're talking about a guy that was a legitimate um, All SEC performer, and the only really guaranteed thing. So now all of a sudden you go from not having him to a junior college kid that always has a little bit of a curve. I mean, we've all, I mean, you, you just don't know about Juco kids. Um, and, uh, and you don't, and you don't know about Hunter and then you still got Bray. And so all indications, I think the, you know, for me being a UT, just not a big fan of UT. Um, you could tell in Derek Dooley's voice that number one, this was, out of left field, it was obviously a new occurrence. So this, this which we believe is a substance abuse issue, just popped up because and, and, two days prior he took all all first rip. And it's not his first, first reps, yeah, and not his um, first occurrence either. But he, if you're Derek Dooley, you know, and this is, and he talked about it. I mean, as a coach, your biggest casualty as a coach is the uh, is the decisions of eighteen to twenty two year olds and at some point in time, you know, and Derek Dooley, you know, did that this summer. He basically took a chance on a kid that had a troubled past that was having a hard time kind of learning probably for the first time in his life to deal with discipline and a lot of those types of things. And, you know, a part of Derek Dooley, um, you know, was willing to go the extra mile for a guy and try to get – what was out of him and from all indications from everybody across the board and you could hear it in all of the the Knoxville guys that called in that I listened to on the radio that he had it was not an attitude deal it wasn't he blew up the coaching staff like it was this summer or or years past um, you know that it was by all indications he was doing everything he was supposed to be doing um, you know from a practice standpoint and from an attitude standpoint um, and so for Derek Dooley to see all that progress made and then him still make a decision that he made that, that forces his hand, um, it's just got to be frustrating. And to have it happen, 
you know, less than a week before the game um, and kind of move on, um, it, it's got to be difficult. And you could tell that he was – you could tell in his comments that, you know, the guy was actually hurt. Um, but he also knows that not only does it hurt him from a player standpoint, it hurts him from an absolute <laughs> team standpoint. And Will he be there next year's yeah. standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Derek Dooley's – gotten to the point where he knows that he's got to perform and win uh to do that and uh just got to be just got to be frustrating uh as a ut fan um because it seemed like he was kind of turning the page but um a big 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 loss uh for those guys and you know but the interesting thing if you heard herman lathers who's the the uh um the you know middle linebacker that's got such a great story you know and is a guy that's all about team um, to hear his comments of you know you know we worked with him this summer when he was here and we worked without him and uh, so you know he kind of alluded to the fact that hey this is not a big surprise to us there's a chance that we all kind of knew in the back of our head that you know Derek is you know he was a me guy and uh, and obviously made another me decision that forced their hand. And I don't think from a team standpoint, they're going to be totally affected from an attitude standpoint um, because they've seen this story before. Um, it's just you're taking a 1,000 yards away in an offense that didn't have Bray last year or Hunter for half the season. And I guess we'll talk about it again when we get to the picks or talk about the upcoming games. But – you know, the other positive, I guess, if you have to have a positive for Tennessee is that you do have Hunter and you do have Patterson. Yeah. I mean, you've got two potentially all SEC wide receivers. But what do you have after that? I mean, yeah. look at their receivers. I mean, I wish Drew was here to kind of give me their depth chart. But, I mean, you're going back to Rodgers. I mean, the Zach Rodgers and those guys that were fourth and fifth and sixth receivers that now all of a sudden are your third, fourth, and fifth options. Right. And uh, from a depth standpoint, um, yeah, you maybe can camouflage this and that, and you've got Hunter and you've got Patterson, but there's no way, shape, or form that you were going to totally um, not see a difference out there with you know Derek Rogers on the on the field. I mean, he was a legit physical receiver um, that you know could have easily put up 1,200 yards this year. So you know that that brings up an interesting thing when you think about it, and and. Tell me who who was who was drugs and who was not drugs. We and we'll never know yeah. for for certain. But Dyer, yep, Crowell, the yeah, Crowell. I'm trying to remember. Was I, that I can't remember drug either. Related or just stupidity? No, you know what? He had weapons that and drugs dr possibly. Yeah, I think they but he stopped, had weapons. In they the stopped the school. car because they thought they smelled marijuana yeah. and they couldn't find any. So we're going to give that one to drugs. Um, yeah, he see. had altered serial numbers. Yeah, yeah you got to love that. But but he was initially stopped because they thought uh, there were the police yeah. officer smelt marijuana. Um, so you got Dyer, Crowell, uh, Rogers, uh, Rambo for Georgia. Yeah. With the pot brownies. Now Matthew. He's, he's a couple games. Matthew. Yeah. That's five. Five playmakers, not yeah. just middle of the road kind yeah. of guys in the SEC. These are big name. SEC, you know, it's a huge epidemic that I think is going on in college sports. Is this this whole kind of drug use, you know, things that are, um, I mean, to even go into, you know, painkillers and that type of stuff. It's things that I know from an athletic standpoint. Oh, well, we don't you know, even go down get, the painkiller yeah, route. I mean, I mean, you're talking about kids that are getting hurt and injuries and that type of stuff. Is, um, you know, that's a huge epidemic that's going across not only sports but across the country yeah. and as a whole um, in substance abuse from that standpoint but uh, that seems to be more of a an, an issue and and the, the NCAA is going to have to do something because it affects the, the product and you know that's one thing about the NFL it's always you know what is it does it hurt the shield you know the NCAA doesn't have a shield but it does hurt the the product that's being out there we want to see folks like Rogers yeah. And Crowell, and I think Dyer. I think the SEC would like to see a standardized. That's the whole problem is that when you get into each institution, yeah, because you might policies, be we, yeah, the way we understand we it is that, three. Yeah. You know, Florida is four. Yeah, Florida. Uh, I don't think you get suspended until the after the fourth 
time. Uh, I think Georgia, Mississippi State, and uh, there was another one that you said last time that actually has a suspension after the first um, first violation. Um, you know, and so uh, Ole Miss has got one that they're actually trying to look at. Your new guy from Western Kentucky, that's the AD, is trying to change it, but. Um, there's suspensions, but there's no set number that gets you kicked off the team uh, and according to their bylaws. So it's all different across the board, and trying to standardize that is going to be difficult. And then you take into consideration outside the SEC and yeah, now the you're Sports talking, Illustrated article with regards to Oregon and um, those types of things when you get out there on the West Coast. One. Well, Oregon, they, they had the either Sports Illustrated or ESPN the magazine where they um, – discuss college football and marijuana use and the Oregon had uh, roughly about a dozen players that that basically spoke anonymously that said that over 60 percent of their football team used marijuana because Oregon was a state well it grows in their backyard right. in Oregon but the the state um, the institution's hands are held because the state law does not allow them to do random drug testing so there's not a way that a kid at Oregon can actually be randomly drug test. Um, and so that creates this whole kind of dynamic. And so it was, it was interesting. I mean, there, and so it kind of opened up a whole debate, which we could go on forever. So can, so you want to be a professional football team in Oregon. <laughs> they, how come Portland doesn't have one? You would think if I that's know. the case, they're you know? a trailblazer town, man. Uh, not anymore. They, they blaze right on out of there is what they did. Uh, you would think it'd be the other way around with the NBA too, and and that's a whole other subject. And we've talked about that is the marijuana use, yeah. and, and is it right or wrong to be testing for that stuff? And, yeah, the whole synthetic stuff. Yeah. Kind of, I don't know any. I don't, I don't understand it. Don't know anything about it. But it's it's, it's not, obviously a huge deal. Yeah, it's not something that I'm not part of that culture. Yeah. And, and and that's and that's another thing is there's a culture inside. Oh yeah. Um, you know, collegiate sports, especially when you're talking about those large D1 schools, or BCS schools. Look how hard, far back I'm going. Uh, you know, those BCS schools. There's a different culture than that I'm not a part of, or wouldn't even be. Uh, you know, I think most people would be surprised yeah. uh, if they truly knew the culture that goes on around there. And. Uh, you know that's not what this podcast is about, and I don't even want to go down that way. So, let's let's take a look here. I think any other news that I miss? I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I mean, just other than just depth chart stuff and all that kind of stuff to get you all excited about football. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, for your team, yes, you know, that's that's exactly. nothing that's entertaining to to talk about on a podcast. Uh, that covers all the SEC. Unless, Why is that kid not on the two deep? And, unless, <laughs> unless we were talking about your team, yeah. and then then you'd be excited, I guess. But um, so. you know, let's let's take a look here at some uh, some of this week's action, um, and, and I guess now's a good time uh, to let you guys know how we're doing our pick, picks this this year. Uh, in the last year, if you listened at all, what we did was we. We did a weekly segment of the, the podcast, and we put that up separately where we go through and we look at the games and give our our picks and put those out there. Uh, and there's a separate video version of that one. And so we'll, we'll, as, the, as we get into the season, we'll probably put out some of those. But what we are doing is we've created a Yahoo page on Yahoo Fantasy and I've given everyone that might be interested the ability to come join in uh, and try that out. So all you have to do is email me at comments at secsportsroundtable.com. Now, if you do that, what we'll do is give you the group ID and the passcode so that you can join in uh, and be part of this. So what we'll enable you to do is uh, take part and see how well you do against the hosts and last year uh, you know looking at it as a whole all the uh, hosts in general if you look at the totals we were about 58 percent against the spread yeah that's not bad um, I mean if Drew didn't drag us down Drew, I mean we there were there were two people that were sub 500 and I wasn't going to name names yeah. um, I was and uh, and it there was one other one and it, I, Drew doing a nice surprise this year for the winter where he's going to take them to L to Las Vegas or somewhere like that for three nights, something like that. That's that's you're gonna have to ask Drew okay. that. We'll ask him. We'll catch up with him next time. Um, but what you will do is uh, 
be able to join that group uh, with the group ID and the passcode and see how you do against that. And last year, um, and I didn't, I didn't go back and recalculate this because I have it somewhere in notes, but I just didn't have time to do it. But the last post we have that I saw was for the bowl games. Um, and we didn't do a final one that I could see. And I, I probably did and just missed it. I just had five minutes before to, to check into it. But before the bowl games, myself and uh, Brett were tied at 59, 29, and 7. Yeah. And that's a 68%, almost 68% uh, winning percentage against the spread. That's pretty strong. I that's, think it's really strong. And. I got to up my game in the football this year because I totally destroyed y'all in the basketball, I believe. But, uh, but uh, I'm I'm looking forward to this with the the two extra teams and two extra games uh, potentially on a weekly basis with uh, Texas A&M and Missouri. I think it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun, man. That was a lot of that was a lot of stuff to kind of see. Uh, it's kind of fun to see how people pick and when you're going against the spread and all that good stuff. And and, and- I'm not a gambler. I, you know, I, I go to Vegas. I've been three or four times, and to me, I, I just don't like the thought of handing somebody my money because I know I'm not getting it back. And see, I'm one of those guys. If I take a hundred dollars and I'm up five hundred, and I lose it all, your real gambler goes, "I lost a hundred dollars. I lost five hundred. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm the exact opposite. I had whatever I get up. I, I know that's my money. And there was I, only I one time I. I've been up, and you were there for that night. That was a random night. We all won that night. Yeah, um, that was good stuff. And and but you have to at least I do. Except I, for Drew, Drew had a rough night. <laughs> he did, uh, but I have to go to one of those as a. Uh, that's like going to a ball game. You know, yeah. that's an expense. You, oh yeah. You know, that's the way because I, I can't treat it as gambling because I'm not. I I just that's not in my nature yeah. to to say I can make money there because I know that Vegas has got those big buildings for one reason, Vegas wins. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, to to know that and know that, you know, as a whole we were over 58%. And like you said, if you took out those two uh, sub-500 teams, the the group itself would have been over 60% uh, against the spread. So, you know, I'm not here to brag, but, you know, it just goes to show that we kind of know football a little bit. Yeah. Uh, So – you know that's and that's fun. So we'd like to get you guys uh, that are listening out here. We'd love to have you guys join in. Like I said, so comments at secsportsroundtable.com, and I will get you the ability to join in that group. So uh, we're going to keep it clean. I'll moderate that. So just know that if you want to join in, it it'll be be clean. I might even have to edit Drew a little bit. Uh, but uh, want to love to. I don't know. I think. In the past, doesn't Yahoo max those out at like fifty people on those? Yeah, I, I have no idea. You know, if it's if it's fifty, I'd love to be able to say let's let's get this thing maxed out. Uh, you know, from the listeners uh, and the the host we have here, and, and see how so we're going to have what about ten of us guys, ten to twelve that are going to be kind of the normal ones that may be on this round. Table. There's there's about eighteen hosts okay. in the past year that have have said here to be a, at a awesome. round table. So if we get all of those involved, plus my, uh, you know, plus it wouldn't take that many yeah. uh, to do that, and then that opens it up to some friends of ours as well. Send that out there, but uh, you know, looking forward to that. So uh, that's out there. The Yahoo page is set up. Um, the hosts have that information. A couple of them have already signed up. I'm a little disappointed the spread information's not out there already. I mean, we're, but I guess it's generally Monday before when you see that. Uh, so hopefully we'll see the the actual spread to get up there so we can make those picks um, in the next couple days. And that's another thing that by having the podcasts on Tuesday yeah. worked well for us is the spreads were out there. So when we're making those picks, uh, it's just too early. Now we're just picking straight up. And these first, you know, when you're looking at the first games of the season, there's, uh, if you look at my podcast or looking at the website, secsrt.com, uh, there's a, Hello, little man. Had a had a guest just join us for a second. But if you do go to the to the website SECSRT, there's a blog post out there, games to watch in week one. And I, I really there was just four to highlight of real unless you're you know like you're a Mississippi yeah. State fan, so you know Jackson State's yeah. going to be a get game for you to be uh, interested in. The the casual SEC fans not going to be right. as 
uh, into some of those games. Uh, so you know, there's only like four games, uh, and there's might might it's going to be hard to put spreads on some of these yeah. when you're talking to Jackson State or Jacksonville State, Southeast Louisiana. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's that's where it becomes more difficult to make those picks because the spreads. When you do see it, you're going to probably see some of these to be like 30 point favorites. Oh, yeah. And so uh, we'll kind of look through those real quick. We've got uh, the list of the games. We're going to start with Thursday's action, and that's USC at Vandy. Uh, like we said, they're going to kick off the college football season for us. Is game day coming here? Do you know? No, the game day is going to be at the um, Michigan Alabama game for Saturday, but they'll actually have Thursday you know, whatever hoopla they'll have with the game, but there won't be an actual game day. Um, that'll just be on Saturdays. Okay. Um, but they'll, they'll probably have a little bit more than just the normal crew here oh, because yeah. cause it's that college kickoff, yeah. the Chick-fil-A kickoff, right? That, no, that's going to be Friday and Saturday, Friday which is and the Saturday. Chick-fil-A thing. Oh, that's going to be in Atlanta. But uh, this is just, you know, uh, it's, it's funny because South Carolina has done this a lot. I mean, we did it back-to-back -back years, South Carolina, Mississippi State, four or five years ago, or gosh, probably been longer than that, when Croom was there um, to start off the football season. Um, so it's it's always tough. I mean, to start off as an SEC opponent, I mean, somebody's going to get the leg up early uh, and somebody's going to get off uh, on a rough start uh, from the beginning because you know those games are – they count. And, they uh, count, and it's it's East matchups too. It's not even yeah. just SEC East versus West. It's two yeah. East teams playing each other. So even a bigger hole to yeah. have to dig yourself out of. And the one thing that uh, kind of got me bummed about this is, um, you know, the Titans have their fourth preseason game at six at six p.m. that night here in Nashville. So, um, and I know there's not a lot you can do with that, but um, I'm a little. I wasn't going to go to the game, and then my wife's got club level seats and a parking pass and that were given to us so we're going to go take advantage go with some friends but um so i'm going to have to dvr this thing and get back to the house and try to catch up with it but that i made that connection today and, and of all places sitting in church it's like you know it just hit me the titans play their last preseason game thursday and bam it's going to be a mess downtown it's going to be an I absolute mean, mess downtown thank goodness you've got 30 blocks between yeah. the two Two or 28 blocks or so, yeah. and a river uh, between the two uh, stadiums. But uh, that's Vanderbilt holds what 45,000? Is that 41, right? 41, I think, or something like that. And and Somewhere. you're probably going to see a sellout. Oh yeah. Uh, and the Titans. I mean, luckily it's a preseason game. Most of your starters are going to be. Yeah, this is going to be kind of the limited dreadful action. preseason game. Yeah. So I don't I don't see the crowd. I mean, last Thursday I went last Thursday, and uh, or this past Thursday and. It was kind of the, the first preseason game at home, and so you had and, a really and, good crowd. And it's the third. That's the game to watch. Yeah. You know, that's and so the, most of your the starters. starters went into the second half and that type of stuff, so it was good. And I know we're talking about picks, but I'm going to throw this out as kind of a, a one-off, not anything SEC-related. Um, but the Titans broke out their new Jumbotrons, which are the largest yes. outdoor Jumbotrons in the country. Um, they're only the only ones bigger are the ones in the Texas Stadium. I was gonna say the only ones bigger is an indoor, and it's yeah. it's Jerry's. And uh, so it was really really ridiculous to see those um, new sound system, new sound system, new elevators that that take eleven thousand people to the upper decks in under twenty minutes. That's moving people. That is. And uh, and then they actually built, which is kind of Music City esque. They do it at the hockey games, but they build a stage under one of the jumbotrons on the north end. Um, the, and the only bummer about the whole thing is they got Phil Vassar for the whole year as the entertainer, which he is so old and irrelevant. I don't understand. I know he wrote a lot of great songs, but just a complete garbage pick on my end. I just so he's at every... all the people that you could pick in Music City to come. They get Phil Vasher, who has this cheesy goatee now, and his hat on backwards and sunglasses at 7:30 at night, and it's pitch black. He's at every terrible. game. Every game, he is the 2012 season entertainer, I guess. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah. I knew, I knew about that's the what stage. I was told, and so I'm hoping that that is wrong. 
Maybe but maybe he got that. Uh, I felt like it was 1999. Maybe he received that as a, a name because he was the first one. Who knows? It was garbage. But anyway, so I digress. Let's get off the tight. So did back he, all he this. played was his hits, and his hits were from like 15 years ago. Is yeah, what you're I saying? mean, like that. Like I saw Phil Phil Vasher. Like I remember moving here in 2000 and going with a group to the old hotel out there by the airport where he played the piano and all that kind of stuff. Um, before he was big. Before he was big. I mean, he had written the songs. That, you know, he, he made it as a songwriter first before he decided to, right. you know, try try to pull a Brad Paisley and uh, become a big big rock star too. But um, I don't know. It was just, it's just I was just, it was just awful. It's terrible, horrible pick. They I, did a lot of good things, but I'm just like Phil Vassar is just so irrelevant. It's not even funny. How do you really feel about that? I mean, it's just it just Drove me crazy. I'm like, of all the things, I mean, ugh. anyway, he's not reaching the young demographic, that's for sure. That's just me. So let's back to Vandy, South Carolina. I think this is going to be an awesome atmosphere uh, for Vanderbilt standpoint. Um, I actually saw a fantastic tweet by James Franklin earlier today that said, Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> LOL. I love it when a grown man does LOL. But uh, so I always thought that was kind of funny. But um, you know that for James Franklin has built this whole spring and summer to lead up to this game. So I, I think you know from that standpoint, they're going to be. I mean, South Carolina is going to have to come here and play. And South Carolina sometimes starts off slow. They don't play Vanderbilt very well. Um, and I just look for this to be a um, a good game. I, I think South Carolina, from my standpoint, is going to win the ball game um, because I think they're going to hand it to Marcus Lattimore, and he's just going to run forever. Um, I think that's just what's going to happen. But uh, I won't be totally surprised if Vanderbilt comes in there and ekes out a victory. Yeah, it's it's going to be difficult. Uh, Vanderbilt's going to have to play a great, great game to do that. Um, I don't think it's impossible, but I'm like you. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, unlikely at that point, and we'll we'll know more once we see the uh, actual. And heaven forbid that um, any of this hurricane weather gets on through up into Nashville and Tennessee, because that crowd you're talking about, you know, it still is Vandy. So inclement weather comes where they can't actually park in their little garage and walk their 100 feet in sunshiny or perfect weather conditions, then you're going to have a light crowd. Um, that's just Vanderbilt. So I'm hoping that the uh, the weather holds clear, but there could be a possibility of a little bit of rain. You think even with all the excitement that Franklin's trying to do this year that, that that's going to be the case for this game? I don't, I don't think so, but – that's Vanderbilt me. never underestimates me when it comes to the 65 and older crowd. That's about 20,000 of them. I, I think I, I agree with you that you know the Vanderbilt fans will to say fair weather is, but I I believe that even if it's raining or not the perfect weather for this event, the way he's talked it up and the excitement that's on West End, it's going to be there. Now it's only going to take a loss or two for it all that yeah. goodwill and excitement to disappear. So I, I don't think that's going to be an issue here. And that's the biggest thing Vanderbilt's going to have going for him is this is probably going to be the most excitement that's been seen at Vanderbilt for a home game. In a while, probably since they had game day here when they started off that 4-0 and or 5-0 and a couple of years ago. Yeah. A few years, man, that's been like four or five years. With but, Bobby Johnson. Yeah, yeah. but, um, you know, that's uh, it's definitely going to be a lively atmosphere. And I give James Franklin kudos for – you know, really drumming down the season tickets and getting the excitement going, and um, you know, I think I think Vanderbilt is going to, on a from an offensive standpoint, be able to move the ball and do some things. I'm just, I just want to see what their defense actually does um, because they lost. You lose a Chris Marv and some of those really really good leadership and those corners that they lost. They were really good football players, but they had a lot of experience. So I'm interested to see, and I think I think Lattis, I think Lattimore is going to be on a little bit of a mission to let everybody know in the SEC that he's back and that he's got no issues with his knee, and um, 
you know, and it's, I, th- I think they're going to be too much to handle, but um, we'll see. Yeah, well, that's that's one of the four games I have that's that I that I oh, yeah. circled as a game to watch. That's a good one. And and the next one's not one we're going to have to spend a lot of time on. It's A and M at lot. Yeah, La Tech. I had to look down to make sure that I'll was tell up. you a little experience about La Tech. And they, Rustin, they can surprise Louisiana. you, right? Well, obviously that was the downfall of Croons last year at Mississippi State when we went to La Tech and lost uh, to open up the football season. Um, but you want to talk about the most jacked-up stadium that you'll ever see in your life. You guys need to check in if you're listening to this podcast and look at this stadium. My parents went to the game, and my dad shot me a picture from his phone because the football stadium has, like, the old-school fixed features, um, bleachers, and they don't arc around the end zone. They just go straight. So my parents were sitting 20 yards past the end zone (laughs) straight away. So they basically had to turn and look back. Um, they did not. They did not turn or anything. It was. He said it was the worst seating arrangement he had ever seen in a football stadium. He was literally twenty yards behind, past the the end zone, having to look back just to see their own twenty yard line. Um, so it was just a horrendous environment. But they followed up with a nice L. So uh, I don't think there's going to be any issues whatsoever. Texas A&M is going to go in there and take care of business. Yeah, I, I agree totally. The next game, though, is another game I've got circled as a game to watch, and that's going to be uh, the first Chick-fil-A game. Yes. And that's going to be uh, UT uh, hosting North Carolina State, even though it's on neutral site or neutral field. Yeah. Uh, NC State's the home team. I tell you what, I'm, I'm excited to see this game. I'm, um, we're, my wife and I are going to her parents' house on Friday, so I'm I'm trying to work around arrangements now that it starts at 6:30 Central to to get there on time to be able to see the start of this game. But you know, I don't know if you've seen this, Shane, but uh, talked to a ton of people here in Nashville that are going to this game. Um, I think it's going to be, I think it's a, such a big game for Tennessee fans, and it's an opportunity to be kind of in this um, meaningful start to a season and going to Atlanta, a very accessible place for Tennessee fans. Um, I think you're going to see a huge crowd. So I'm interested to see what the crowd is going to be like when we get there, um, you know, come Friday night. And that's being played at the Georgia Dome, right? Georgia Dome, yeah. So, yeah. A huge game. Friday night, you know, you're going to have Auburn and Clemson there because they're playing the next day. But uh, Supposedly, uh, from the people I've heard, it's just a ton of people that are, I know are my UT friends um, that are all heading down there, and they're making a big weekend out of it. So it ought to be interesting. And you know, the early line had UT as a favorite. I don't know what it is now, and it's not up on. I want to say that it was you like know, six it was a and a half. High, like it was six, six and a half. Yeah. And I think uh, with uh, Rogers gone, it's actually dropped. It's probably put that in half. That's what so I was thinking. So it's closer it's to a field goal a- game, and I think. Uh, you know, NC State, I mean, I'm interested to see. I mean, because NC State's got the quarterback. I mean, if you if you guys remember NC State, you know, they, they said, oh, Russell Wilson, we don't want you anymore. You just go to Wisconsin, and next year you'll start for Seattle. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, uh, as a rookie in the NFL, which is what it looks like it's going to do at 5'10". Um, but, you know, a lot of people, when you started getting into this Russell Wilson, Wisconsin world last year, people kind of forgot about NC State and, you know, they got that quarterback that kind of went in there and, and kind of held his own um, amongst the uh, – which had to be a difficult environment losing somebody like a Russell Wilson that had been there forever. Um, so um, I'm interested to see. They got a good quarterback, and I think NC State, um, there's not a lot of – you know, there's all the noise about Derek Dooley and being on the hot seat. and um, So – I don't know much about NC State. I just know they have a good quarterback. So uh, with the news of Rodgers, you just want to see how it affects them. Yeah, no, that's the big the big question mark. We've already talked about that. The, the, there's a couple question marks with Tennessee, and it's what's going to happen. Is, is is there going to be somebody that can step in and, and try to take that place of Rodgers now right. that he's not going to be there? Uh, is Hunter going to be able to uh, be what he was last year before the Florida game? Uh, and it's going to take him to get hit to do that. You know, he's going to. And Tennessee's got to run the football. 
you know, and that, that's, that's the what, question mark. You know, when you know, and Derek Dooley was very open about that. I mean, when things fell apart last year, when they took on some injuries, the thing that actually kind of snuck up on them was the the inability uh, to run the football to alleviate some of the issues that they actually had. I, I have no doubt that that Tennessee can throw the football, but if they are running the football like they were last year, um, they're still going to have you know, they're still going to be somewhat one-dimensional and still going to struggle in some games. Um, and, you know, with with this loss, they've got to be able to kind of go out. And from all indication is the offensive line is, uh, has been, you know, kind of uh, a lot more dominant than they were. And they've got all the experience behind them to be that dominant line and get them running the football. But I don't know how dynamic of the backs you're going to have. Um, and then to flip it on the other side, Shane, would be can they stop the run, you know, with the new defensive whole coaching staff um, and the 3-4, 4-3, 5-2, you know, packages that they're going to be doing, you know, how is that going to work? And, you know, can NC State run the ball to kind of control the game? So a lot of stuff, man. It's a very, very, very intriguing game. Yeah, no, I, I agree. So – the, there's there's a lot more unknown there than there was you know this time last week when we were talking about it, and it but even then it's going to make it more of an exciting game I think uh, we're going to run through the next ones pretty quick Buffalo at Georgia I don't think there should be any issues there the the number is how high is that going to be exactly and that changes do you do you put money on on Buffalo versus Georgia at that point uh, the the next one same thing Bowling Green at Florida. You know, Bowling Green typically has pretty decent ball clubs, you know, because isn't that Ohio school, if I'm not mistaken? Um, yeah, Ohio. Yeah. yeah. So, you Cause know. Because what's funny is Bowling Green, Kentucky is yeah, Western. So. Yeah. The, um, yeah, so the the Bowling Green it usually has a somewhat decent football team, and so uh, I would keep an eye on that game just to see how Florida defensively comes out and dominates and then their quarterback situation, kind of yeah. what's going on there. So the next game is the third game of four that I have circled as games to watch, and that's going to be Clemson at Auburn. And we've yeah. talked a little bit about that. Uh, you know, even more dynamics are, are occurring with this game now that we've got that suspension of the center at Auburn. Uh, yeah. You know, they were going to have a tough time of it as it is. Uh, you know, maybe that's another costly snap at some point. You know, um, what game was it? Was it? Last week's podcast, we were talking about Tennessee and the snap. Yeah. You know where, or no, it was, it was Britain. Pouncy. It was yeah. Britain having yeah, those dreams, those nightmares of a bad snap costing them the game, and that could be Auburn. Yeah. You know, that could be an Auburn fan. That could be with the War Eagle Nation come Sunday morning, yeah. uh, having just that because of that situation, because of the pressure of playing a team like Clemson and not having that cupcake game won. So, uh, big big mistake. Uh, from the center standpoint, and I bet he wish he could have that night over oh, again. Yeah. But uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see where that one comes in. Yeah, and the Clemson you know, on the on the other side, and we talked about this as well. The Sammy Watkins, they're all American, do everything receiver. Uh, if you watched anything with regards to Clemson last year, until they fell apart there a little bit at the end, um, was was just as dominant as any player in college football as a true freshman. Um, and uh, Tosh Boyd, you know, is obviously a seasoned quarterback. Um, that's going to be for them. So um, Sammy Watkins not being part of that game is going to be a big deal. Did did he make the uh, Heisman watch list you know, preseason? I, I probably – I know Watkins probably had to. Have, I was thinking but I don't Todd. Boyd. You know, Todd, he, did, he uh, didn't. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's still seeing uh, uh, Devin Taylor and – uh, Clowney from South Carolina just destroying him last year in that game. Uh, oh yeah, the last I game about they about that. killed that guy. Um, but uh, you know, Clemson talk I think, about nightmares. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's one of those things where this is going to be an intriguing game because I think Clemson. You know, I, I read a saw a stat the other day because Dabo Sweeney is one of the most enigma coaches out there. It's kind of funny, but uh, he. You know, if you remember this game last year at Clemson um, where they won the game and he was basically screaming bloody murder at the reporter after the game like they had yeah. won the national championship, which went all over YouTube. Um, but they had lost 14 games against Auburn. They were 0-14 against Auburn in their history, uh, which I thought was kind of a random 
uh, stat. But yeah. uh, so they had finally won one, and uh, defending national champion that type of thing. So, um, so I know that the. I'm interested to see how this game goes because I think Clemson's got a lot in store for the ACC um, this year, and are you know one of those teams that's up there in the top what 20 in the country, um, possibly top 15. So, and then Auburn, yeah, they got two tough tests coming right out of the gate. Yes, they do, because uh, they come to you second, yeah. right? So, I, I, you know, I, I'd like to say I'd. It's an SEC sports roundtable podcast, and I like to do that, but. I don't think I don't think they've got to win in that yeah, game. Yeah, I'm not voting for Auburn to win anything ever again, so I don't care. After the last two years, I don't care if Auburn ever wins again. That's just my personal opinion. <laughs> no love lost there. No. All right, so now we go through a series of pretty easy games to, to figure out. LSU is hosting North Texas. Uh, and again, some of these, yeah. like that game, is how high is that number exactly. going to be? Uh, what is going to be interesting is to see the uh, – quarterback uh, first time getting on the field I think they're really going to want to try to stretch the field and see what he can do a little bit uh, give him some some good confidence uh, so I look for a high number from LSU yeah. in that game uh, Central Arkansas is at Ole Miss one of the few wins in, yeah. on Ole Miss's schedule this year yeah I think so I mean the thing you want to see from Ole Miss is how clean and crisp are they you know kind of in the first game under freeze and kind of what the attitude is and um, kind of excitement level from that standpoint. So it's a good, it's a good game to kind of get going. Yeah, I, I agree. And that, that you bring up an interesting point there with with that is that uh, you can see how well a, a team is coached when you have a new coach come right. in like that and see how disciplined they may or may not be. So, uh, And that'll be a, a good way to determine that is the penalties. Yeah. You know, are there a lot of stupid penalties uh, that, those silly five yards that add up a yeah. lot. A lot of offsides, illegal motions, things like that really go into a discipline of yeah. a team. And, and Ole Miss has had a lot of attrition here in the last two weeks. And so, um, you know, I haven't really kept up with it uh, lately. But, uh, um, you know, from Ole Miss fans or some of my buddies, you know, it's going to be a long year for them, they feel like. Um, but, you know, unlike Houston Nutt, there was not, you know, he was kind of the, you know, the preacher man, so to speak, you know, the reverend, and uh, was always a motivating factor, but that just kind of disappeared. So, you know, this guy's, you know, supposedly going to kind of bring back a little bit of enthusiasm and excitement, a little bit of fire that Ole Miss really has needed. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And and the point you make there is that, you know, Ole Miss fans see that there's improvement in the horizon. I don't think they had that confidence with Nutter, it'd still be there. Yeah. Uh, they they weren't going to see improvement, and and Freeze is putting his stamp on his recruiting. It's it's going to be a little rebuilding time for there, and and the problem is they're in the West. Yeah, and it's such a tough. And you you know as yeah. a Mississippi State fan, it's tough to get. You know they might become in the middle. There yeah. might be a larger middle pack, um, but yeah, I mean when you add in Texas A and M, and you know in states halfway decent. Yeah, I mean it's just you're going brutal. Get, you're going to get you know. What you might have is 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 you've got the haves, the wannabes, and the have-nots yeah. uh, in the SEC West yeah. right now. You might just have the haves and have-nots, yeah. you know, exactly. or the, or the haves and the wannabes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and that's what that's that's what you can hope to obtain to uh, as an Ole Miss program because it's going to be hard to get from that wannabes into the haves. Right. You know, there's only three right now on that side, uh, and even then, Arkansas has trouble playing. I mean, they had a loss against both teams, uh, LSU and Alabama last year. So yeah. interesting to see what's going to happen there. Uh, the next game we've got is Jackson State at Mississippi State. Shouldn't be any issues there for you guys. What are you looking most forward to out of that game? Well, you know, the one thing I'm looking for, you know, Jackson State, which I thought was kind of an interesting line, they've got nine seniors and two juniors on their starting defense. Um, so – it's kind of funny. We played them four years ago in uh, 2009, Dan Mullen's first year. Um, and uh, so uh, Mullen, I thought, was pretty funny when he said that they're, they're going to have some guys that are going to be playing their second game in our stadium and we're going to be playing some guys in their first game in our stadium. So, um, you know, when you get those those first-day games. But, uh, 
Um, you know, for me, there's there's two things are going to happen because I think I don't think there's been any preparation whatsoever for Jackson State. I think everything's been geared for that week two game with Auburn, and I want to be I want I'll be interested to see. There's going to be one of two things happen. Everybody knows that Russell is the new quarterback, and we're going to open it up some, you know. Right. But I'm wondering, there's two things that are going to happen. Either we throw the ball all over the place in Jackson State to show Auburn that we're going to throw it around, and then we feel like we can come out and run, establish the run, and, and, and kind of do some play-action stuff against Auburn, or we're just going to run the ball down Jackson State's throat and not show a thing. Um, and uh, so I'm interested to kind of see how that rolls. Uh, rolls around and kind of goes from there. But uh, From an outsider, do you know what I see him doing? What's that? Giving him just enough confidence to know that he's yeah. got the ability, and if the run game is effective, just yeah. pound it. Yeah. Why, why, why waste any cards uh, when you've got the hand yeah. to beat a team like uh, Jackson State when you have Auburn the next week? The that's fun, the that's fun my thing thought. Was, that's the way I would coach. The, the, the funny thing was is that uh, yesterday they had a fan day at uh, Mississippi State, which was the thousandth day they've hold, held the Egg Bowl trophy, and uh, so you got to get your picture taken with the Egg Bowl with the uh, hashtag Hell State and thousand days of the Egg Bowl. So that was kind of funny, but uh, no salt to rub right there. Nah, is it? and uh, and they actually had the student uh, uh, tickets go on sale. So they had a seventy eight hundred students that stood in line through the junction and pouring down rain to go get season tickets, and they'll have the other 3,200 that will go on sale on Monday. So they have 11,000 student tickets, which is by far the largest student ticket um, disbursement in the SEC. So it's kind of a interesting thing. Now, is there uh, – didn't – did Mississippi State do some more renovations? Did they do some more this year on the? No, nah, they've – well, they've done just a couple of things okay. with the field, but they're, they've already barricaded and they're going to break ground on the 70 – five million dollar north end zone okay it's coming it's coming and it'll be here for the 2014 season uh so not this year not next year is that the tv side no that's the opposite end so So they're going to pull that in that's closer to where the tailgating action is right no it's opposite Opposite of where it is yeah the scoreboard where it is now is where the junction is okay um but they're going to bowl that in and uh really do some amazing stuff it's going to have some things that sec stadiums don't have currently um, which uh, it's kind of the beauty of Mississippi State and, and even maybe Ole Miss and, and probably even Kentucky in that you don't have 100,000 seats. And so you can put a – we're supposed to have another Jumbotron comparable to the size of the one we have that's going to be incorporated above the goal, the um, the dome, the bold end side. Um, but being able to do some of that, those things and those right. extra benefits that some of the larger stadiums can't do just simply because they don't have the obstruction of views and that type of stuff. So uh, it's going to be pretty interesting. Yeah, it's it. Uh, we need to see if we can get the round table to do a remote for from, from We need to, man. It's going to be funny. I mean, actually, they, they said that after the, the fan day that they had um, a whole slew of people actually doing practice runs for their tailgating spots. So they actually were tailgating because they had kind of a big soccer and volleyball and kind of some of the Olympic sport weekend. And so they did their trial run to kind of get ready for the Saturday, which I thought was quite comical. Well, we need to make some off-air plans to see if we can make that happen. We've got we've got some connections down there and see what we can we can Get make some happen. of those SB Nation guys down there and see if we can't get hooked up. Yes, and uh, get a couple of good guests to, to pop in there in our podcast. That would be, be something we might want to try to – See if we can work out towards the fall. It's not too late to do that. The next game we're looking at is Jacksonville State. So we had Jackson State at Mississippi State. The next one's Jacksonville State at Arkansas. That's going to be a debacle. Yeah, it's it's going to be a way for John L. to showcase. And and you think he's going to have to come out and showcase a little bit as well. He's one of those where new coach in a program that's got a lot of talent. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's let, let's show that we really do belong where we – where we need to be, but they there again, they might try to hold a few things back as well because they follow up with a, a tough week two. Two weeks later, yeah. Uh, what, uh, yeah, yeah, week three opponent with Alabama. Um, so you know, it's not one of those where you've got October games or November games for tough SEC opponents. They're going in, you know, week three with Alabama. So, and they've got another cupcake uh, the next week or. I hate yeah. to call them cupcakes, money games, I guess, for those yeah. programs. So they should, shouldn't should have any problems there. Uh, then, though, we do have the last game I have circled. Uh, 
and that's Michigan out of, at Alabama. And I'm really excited about that game. I have two. I don't. I, I hope Michigan is what everybody thinks they are, and if they are, that should be a good game. What I don't want, though, is the same letdown I had last year when Alabama went to the Big Big Ten. Was it yeah. still the Big Ten? Is that is that what they called it last year? Yeah, I can't remember. When they went to Happy Valley. <laughs> oh yeah. And you know everybody was expecting the Penn State was going to give them a good matchup, and it didn't happen. No. I mean. From the very beginning, Alabama basically took control of that game. They were very methodical, uh, very tactical, and didn't run up the score. We, we've talked about that before. Saban doesn't have to run up the score. He respected uh, Paterno up there. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it was kind of a boring game. It was a very boring game. And, uh, you know, hopefully I, I, you don't have a repeat of that because – I could see that all of a sudden they're able to just stop Denard Robinson uh, from Michigan, and and re- if they can eliminate him, that's their offense. You know, he he can run the ball, he passes. If they're able to control him, and all of a sudden that becomes a very vanilla game because it's yeah. going to be in Tuscaloosa. They're going to have the crowd, and all of a sudden, it's not the game I thought it was going to yeah. be. And, and I'm interested to see because you know Michigan's going to bring a crowd. You know, just because. They're Michigan, Alabama, you know, is just going to go in droves um, over there. And so I think it's going to set up. But, you know, unlike Penn State, they've got such a dynamic quarterback option uh, right. with, with uh, Robinson. And um, I just think there's going to be some fireworks early um, that uh, I'll be interested to see because, you know, Alabama's got to break in some new guys on defense. So, um, I think it's going to be a game that's going to be kind of close in the first half, and I think that Alabama will just kind of wear them down um, after that. But Brady Hoke, I mean, he's won everywhere he's been, so um, I'm looking to see that it's going to be a good game. I, like I said, I'm I'm hoping that it's not, you know, that surprise. I'm expecting a really good game there. Uh, of the four, I'm most excited to watch that one. Right. And so, uh, and then there's another good game Sunday. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we also miss southeastern Louisiana, Missouri. I don't oh, want to yeah. tick off Missouri fans in case yes. like David Nell or somebody is watching or listening to us. But uh, uh, that was one of those many five cupcake games there. That uh, I apologize. Yeah, uh, Missouri shouldn't have an issue yeah. there. They're new uh, to the group, so we don't want to make them too mad. And now, will Franklin be back for that game? Is it? Is it? I have no idea. I haven't kept up with anything with regards to Missouri. I, I know just, he had some banged up a little bit. Yeah, and, uh, I think he's fine. I think from last last indications, you know, we're going to see him come out, and you know, that's that's something else is another gunslinger in the SEC. That's yeah. because that's not what you're used to seeing in the SEC. The yeah. gunslingers aren't here. Uh, there, it doesn't mean we don't have talent. Yeah. But aside from Arkansas, I'll give Tyler Wilson. You know, he's a gunslinger, but uh, you know, all those big arms yeah. that you think of, you don't think of SEC when you think of that. So. Yeah. Uh, Franklin does bring that element to there to oh, yeah. the to the SEC, and so he's going to bring that level of excitement. Uh, but like I said, Sunday does have a game. I'm, I'm oh, yeah. so, I'll be somewhat oh, excited. Oh yeah, man! About. This is like the rivalry in the week one. I I know it's like the it's Daytona. Opposite. It's the Daytona 500 of football. <laughs> That's right. That's awesome, and it's at Louisville, right? It is at Louisville. Man, I'm going to be for those who haven't figured it out. It's UK U of L. Yeah, yeah. So. I, Papa John's. I don't know if we have a chance, but uh, stadium. You know, last year we thought we should be able to win that game, and we gave it away. So maybe yeah. since we have no chance this year, we can come back and steal one. Yeah, you never know in those rivalry things. I think Louisville. I think Louisville's going to have a strong year this year, especially playing in a just a poor Big East. Um, but uh, I definitely think that they're the, uh, the the favorite in that that world. But being at Papa John's and um, kind of getting that thing started off, I think. Uh, and you've got a Louisville program that's top 25 this year. Yeah. Uh, they're expecting With some good things. a great quarterback, I in think. In the Big East. Uh, they're in the Big
and uh, for the first week, and then the next week I'm going to be going to the Mississippi State Auburn game, and I'm going to have to. Uh, for most of you that don't know, it's an 11 a.m. game, and they close the streets to the junction four hours before kickoff. So it means that we have to actually be there before 7 a.m. to set up the tailgate. So it's going to be a little brew most of the time early, early. Yeah, the, the, those 11, 12 o'clock kickoffs are rough for tailgating. Yeah, but they're good if you win because then you can kind of celebrate and just have the rest of the afternoon and evening to watch games and yeah. kind of enjoy the the time. If you lose, it stinks. But then you get to watch football and kind of hang out, and you don't have to be like 11 o'clock getting home. And yeah, I, I like the CBS time frame. Yeah. Too. For, for a, to go to a game, yes, that's a perfect, perfect one. time. You get, uh, you get there early enough that you get some tailgating in, you're out early enough that you can still continue to uh, enjoy yeah. yourself if it's a win. Um, get home and watch more football if it's not. Uh, so that's a good time, but you only get that one game, yeah. one or two games to get that slot uh, from that standpoint. Second would have to be the night games. Yeah. And so you get the excitement there, though. Uh, and I, I guess I'm, not, I'm at an age now where you know going out after the night game is, is a rarity. Oh, yes. Um, so... Well, I, with my round table uh, or my open mic, I really don't have a whole lot to add to that. Um, I'm going to an undisclosed location at this point. I, I doubt the individuals that need to know are going to be listening, but uh, I'm in the same boat you are this weekend as far as I'm getting the better be quiet look from my wife uh, coming off camera here. So I, I'm not going to disclose any details. of. Uh, I've got to go to Memphis for work and uh, do have to do that and going to miss a lot of the football. So uh, I'm so glad that uh, Comcast has worked out their deal with ESPN this year so that Watch ESPN is now on your mobile devices. Nice. Uh, so so there's probably going to be a lot of streaming of the ESPN and ABC games uh, on the iPad and the iPhone Awesome. through this week. And so your Android would get it too. Sweet. So that's one bit of good news is that because uh, last year Comcast didn't have that deal. So, you know, if there was an ESPN3 game, which there were a couple of them that I really wanted to watch, or an ESPNU, I guess is what it was. Was it ESPN3 last year? They changed the names so much. No, nah, ESPN3 it, is just the only mobile device. Well, that's ESPN device, yeah. And then ESPNU is it a separate channel. Is a separate channel. But those are also yeah. broadcasted on ESPN3. Um, and so. It's nice to now that I can at least have that as an option. So when I'm I am out and I can get Wi-Fi or even on the phone with a 3G, uh, catch some of that as well. Awesome. So I'll be doing some of that this week as well for for some of those games. But uh, I'll, on the next week's uh, open mic, I'll have a lot of fun to talk about uh, where where I will be. So I'm excited about that. Sweet. So with that, guys, we're gonna. And I'm looking down at the t the counter. I can't believe we've done it. It's an hour and 20 minutes in to this nice. podcast. And I was like, gosh, there's nothing to talk about. We're only going to have another 30-minute podcast, and we're an hour and 20 minutes in. <laughs> With that, guys, we'll call this podcast done.